Keith here. When I started making the first episode of, I had no experience doing podcast interviews, especially the technical side of things. It was a lot of confusing steps, setting up double enders or making do with low quality recordings on whatever app I could figure out. But it got a whole lot easier when I started using Zencaster. Made for podcasts with Zencaster, it's so easy to do everything. You and your guests log in with a browser and record studio quality sound and up to 4K video, even with an unstable connection. And it's an all-in-one deal. You don't need a lot of different tools or services. With Zencaster, you can create your podcast all in one place and distribute it to Spotify, Apple, and other major platforms. If you've ever thought about making your own podcast, go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code TFEO and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story on Zencaster. Hey, it's Keith. If you're a lover of audio drama like I am, you need to know about the Apollo app. Apollo is designed around audio drama, so finding your next story is easy. You can always listen through Apollo for free, but there's also the Apollo Plus subscription. With it, you get ad-free listening, exclusives, and other bonus content for over 40 shows. And 70% of the revenue on Apollo Plus goes to those creators. Join Apollo Plus through the Apollo Podcasts app or apollopods.com. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of a podcast about audio drama and the creative process. I'm W. Keith Timms, audio drama producer and podcaster. In this show, I listen to the first episode of an audio drama, then have a discussion with the creators about their show, their methods, struggles, and successes. Today, we're discussing the first episode of Be Not Afraid. Afraid. Created by Rebecca Hansen and Tommy Holmberg, Be Not Afraid is a satire of heaven and angels. The show is hosted by Enoch, the Metatron, or Voice of God, performed by Hansen. Enoch is the only mortal to have been employed by God and turned into an angel. Now his main job is to report on important and historical events, broadcasting these to mortal prophets, that is, us, the listeners, across time and space. And it turns out that heaven is highly dysfunctional. Be Not Afraid is part of the Faustian Nonsense Network. I spoke to Rebecca and Tommy remotely from their home in Sweden. Why don't we start with just have each of you introduce yourselves. What is it you do, generally speaking, on Be Not Afraid? My name is Rebecca Hansen, and mainly (laughs) it's my voice you'll be hearing from the beginning because I play the main character and the other voices all the way up to episode six. And then we bring in other voice actors. And I also write and produce and do everything together (laughs) with Tommy. (laughs) And we try to like split up the workload in between us. So my name is Tommy Holmberg. My main work on the audio drama is uh, writing the manuscript and post-production, basically. How did the two of you meet and start working together? Well, we were together already. (laughs) We lived together. Um, Yeah, we met way, way, way many years ago. We were teenagers and uh, have been together ever since. And we've both always liked mythology and religious imagery and uh, that kind of thing. Grew up talking about demonic video games, you know. (laughs) (laughs) But also like fantasy and sci-fi stuff. Yeah, so like um, we met online and then I ended up moving to Tommy's hometown. Have you both always been artistic types? What kind of background do you have in the arts? Yeah, I've always been the artistic type with different kinds of... uh, mediums. Um, I think I started with drawing and like making up little stories in my head and uh, telling stories. I learned to read very early on and my family had a big library with lots of books. And I remember like sifting through mythology books before I could even read just because I was so fascinated with these 
medieval images of hell and demons and <laughs> that kind <Yeah>. of thing. <laughs> yeah, I've always been very artistic and that has been influencing me in my work as a kindergarten teacher too. Yeah, you do a lot of drawing and telling stories and Had you done any kind of uh any kind of writing or similar kind of production acting anything like that before you got into Be Not Afraid? Um I did some uh, together with Tommy, we produced some where I read out loud fan fiction of Good Omens, which is kind of oh, related. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's how it sort of got into this whole thing. Like, maybe we should do our own thing with this. Mm, yeah. Tommy, what is your artistic background? In my daily work, I'm a software engineer. So n not much uh, mm. in the art mm. department there. But uh, I've always been a big consumer of uh, movies and TV shows and also video games. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always liked to create stuff. So I have... Uh, uh, a long trail of abandoned hobbies, but, but I've tried <laughs> many things in the domain of arts, like painting, uh, producing music, photography. I feel like I haven't found my way of expressing myself through art until we started making this audio drama stuff, where yeah. kind of all of the skills that I gathered up on the abandoned hobbies, <laughs> yeah. I, I got used for them in in producing this audio drama. A lot of people don't realize just how many very different artistic disciplines you need to bring to audio drama, you know, not just from writing the scripts, but then music and you have to have good musical sensibilities for editing and sound design, even the cover art. The whole sound design thing is definitely mostly Tommy and yeah. uh, me sitting on the side like, can you make it sound like more... <coughs> <laughs> and he does his best to imitate whatever I just did. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're really creative. I mean, uh, I know the controls, but you you have the mind. Yeah, you it. can find your way in the forest um, of plugins. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you both came together through a shared love of fiction and sci-fi and fantasy. And what is the the genesis for Be Not Afraid? What made you sort of think, let's do an audio drama? We are big consumers of movies and stories and uh, books even. I myself have dyslexia, mm -hmm. so I don't read much. But when we read books together, Rebecca reads out loud to me. So that's how we read books together. And uh, we found ourselves pausing a lot and coming up with our own stories. Like you could be reading and stopping, and then you'd have your own ideas and develop. Yeah, exactly. Well, what if yeah, this and Tommy happened would like after... put up his finger, like, "Wait, hold on." <laughs> yeah, and and. We always, always did that to entertain each other. Mm -hmm. And then we thought like, this might be fun to other people to hear as well. Yeah, along, along those lines, we started to form this idea of actually writing a story with, with a lot of comedy in mind. Yeah, this idea came about when we were, we had just been on a big Good Omens kick and mm -hmm. we're looking to consume even more angel Bible related mm -hmm. media. <laughs> so we were reading Paradise Lost together. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Like the end of 2019, I think. And that's when the idea started to take shape. Like, what if this was retold by the most incompetent angel ever? <laughs> and uh, retold as in, this is how it really went down. Have you all been audio drama listeners? Did you, were you aware of what was out there before you jumped into the field? Mainly just Welcome to Night Vale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and some Swedish uh, podcasts also. We listen to audiobooks a lot as well. Oh yeah, shout out to the Lord of the Rings BBC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody BBC. loves that one. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when I got started, I really, I was aware that audio drama was a thing, but I didn't, I wasn't really a huge consumer of it. You know, of course I found Night Vale, I found some others as well. And that's, that's kind of when I was like, I used to direct plays all the time. Maybe we can convert this into something. So yeah, it's interesting because you have to sort of rethink how you tell the story when it's just, mm -hmm. when it's audio only. Like you have to be extra clear on what's happening in this scene. Anything that's very visual, like it's really hard to, you know, unless you have a character who is literally narrating everything. I think the other thing, though, is that... I think you can do things with sound only that you don't get to do with other forms of media. Audio drama for me has always been very imaginative. Mm. What I mean by that is that it requires the, the listener to invest a lot of their own imagination into what they're hearing in order to make it appear real in their minds. So they're filling in the gaps with their own stuff. I agree completely with, with tapping into people's imagination. 
And mm-hmm. that's part of why we did this. We, we had done some uh, videography before. It takes so much time to get the sound right and the picture right. So when we started with, with this audio drama, one of the goals was to make the production simple. Mm-hmm. So the fewer elements we, we, we had to assemble, uh, the better because we wanted to be able to produce at a decent pace. I sometimes prefer the audio media, especially when it comes to this horror things, like like the the, the creepypod that we listen to. I find often that horror movies don't actually depict the horrific imagery in a convincing way, but my mind can make a lot scarier images. (laughs) At least what's scary to me. So that's kind of the magic here, that uh, people imagine things that are relevant to themselves. That is quite relevant to our audio drama, because we describe biblically correct angels, which are horrific creatures. And there's no chance that we would be able to to make a good representation visually of those angels. You cannot do that image justice, as it is described in like Ezekiel or Daniel or Mm. all the other books where the horrifying angels are described because I have a little bit of a problem with the term biblically accurate angels because (laughs) just normal looking dudes are also biblically accurate angels. Right, right. (laughs) But for the meme, I will accept it. (laughs) Well, you do describe them uh, uh, as beings of wings and eyes. That's really basically what they are. Yeah, angels in your show are pretty nasty, judgmental at times, and violent, um, and horrible. You know, and p- people die when they look at look at them. Um, mm-hmm. Why did you want to approach your storytelling that particular way with those kinds of angels? Uh, because uh, I don't know about you, Tommy, but I like my monsters to be inhuman and mm. terrifying, and especially angels, which are sort of gods. They would have to be, at their core, inhuman and therefore indifferent to human existence. They're not really evil, but more like they don't care. Also, I think we discovered in a lot of the scriptures, or at least the apocryphal scriptures, people were generally afraid when they saw the angels. And a common angel greeting is, be not afraid. And (laughs) why would they need to say that? (laughs) <laughs> if they are not scary creatures. So. I, yeah, I have to laugh every time I hear it in your show, just because yeah. th- this horrible being pops up all wings and eyes and the first thing, uh, don't be scared. Right? <laughs> you know, um, it's, According it, to protocol, we have to say this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious as to what this show means to both of you. What do you think about when you think about being not afraid? I like to explore like the human experience, everyday struggles and existential questions. Enoch, the main character, is of course human to begin with, but transitions into being an angel. He's the only one of his kind who has humanity and has to try to fit in in this alien environment. So Mm. his story is really one of trying to belong. Yeah, that's a recurring theme, like uh, just trying to belong. And uh, that's true of The angels in the show too, especially those in the pilot episode where angels try to live on earth among humans. They like almost LARP humans for a while. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely was thinking about Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman, and I was thinking about, you know, other kind of shows where they take a sort of a humorous look at specifically the Judeo-Christian mythology, where you've got this sort of fish out of water character who's just trying to make sense of this vast universe filled with unimaginable beings that doesn't really care about them. Here's the nervous wreck of a character, and here yeah. is the uncaring <laughs> universe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, um, both of those, uh, uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, are, of course, huge influences on the yeah. story. There is an absurd quality to the things that happen to the characters in Be Not Afraid, especially when you consider that these are supposed to be beings of unimaginable power, the, the founders of creation and that sort of thing. And, mm-hmm. and yet they end up being rather dim at times or <laughs> distracted mm-hmm. or... And even God themselves is like... Oh, did I did I do that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've always been a huge fan of mythology and especially angels and 
I read the Book of Enoch, which is our biggest influence, many years ago prior to this, uh, which has lots of depictions of heaven being this horrible, on fire, crystal water environment. <laughs> and just fascinating. I, I found sci fi elements in so many biblical texts, and it was so fascinating. And especially angels overall, especially the, the many eyed ones. Damn, I love those. Those yeah. are my boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you do, when it's clear that the prophet describing them didn't really know how to put it into words, what they were seeing, like spinning wheels and eyes everywhere and rainbow fractal colors all around and madness overtaking them. It's just, mm, I love that. Do you consider this a sci-fi show? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. First and foremost, it's a comedy. Yeah. So I would say comedy sci-fi. The first episode is called Nephilim, and the story is, it's sort of the creation story of Enoch the Metatron, the Metatron being the voice of God, a messenger who is officially speaks for God. I will try to speak to you in a way that you will understand, using a human language of your current historical dialect. It is better this way, with me using a flesh mouth with a meat muscle, surrounded by bony protrusions and singing a song with wet vocal cords. We first tried the method of just beaming our message directly into your minds, but we did not expect the absolute carnage as so many heads burst like old light bulbs. I wonder how many valuable profits we lost that day. So, a corporeal form it is for me. It feels like eons ago that I wore flesh like this. It is a bit unfamiliar, and the words roll strangely off my tongue. But at the same time, it feels like I became whatever this is, just now. Time works differently here. My name is Enoch, and I was once a human. The story follows a, a group of angels called the Watchers, who are the guardians of life on Earth. But their leader, Samyaza, discovers love and, well, okay, let's be honest, he discovers sex um, with humans. And he sort of corrupts his fellow angels. They take on the guise of other humans and form relationships. They teach the, the early humans science and technology and the arts. They also get women pregnant. These women give birth to these crossbreed giants called the Nephilim, half angel, half human, who are horrible creatures who just eat everything. And heaven has been clueless about this for several years. Heaven eventually finds out. And one of the survivors from this village, Enoch, gets chosen to help fix the mess. Enoch becomes the messenger of God. Where did this first story come from? And why did you want to start with this particular story? Yeah, we were already thinking that we would have this angel messenger thing as a big framing device. I had already read the Book of Enoch, which features this story with the, these angels coming to Earth and breeding with humans. And in the middle of it all was Enoch trying to be a diplomat between them and then being chosen as the voice of God and then being the only human ever who has been to heaven. As we talked about before, I think the, the idea of making this audio drama formed when we were reading Paradise Lost. As I remember it, we, we had discussions about how to do an audio drama. We wanted a reason for using only audio as our medium. Uh, so then we invented this bit of you are hearing this because you are a prophet. Mm. Yes. And then uh, we had to get into the messenger's origin story. So that's why... We go into that in the pilot. As Rebecca said, it's uh, basically just a retelling of the Book of Enoch because we wanted to start with his origin story, of course, since we were going to use him as a podcaster in heaven, basically. Yeah, podcaster in heaven, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is early morning, high up on Mount Hermon. A group of angels have gathered together in secret. Below them, a human village spreads far around the foot of the mountain. These angels in particular are called the Watchers, and they are responsible for guarding life on Earth. 
Their leader, Samyaza, is speaking to them with hushed enthusiasm. Are we in agreement then? This stays between us. If I hear of anyone even hinting of this to anyone else, I'll make sure you get stationed at the gates of Eden. His second in command, Azazel, asks the question that's on everyone's minds. What could you possibly get out of a relationship with a mortal? How can it be worth the trouble we'd be in? Samyaza shrugs, a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but love, it, it almost feels like the feeling you get when the Almighty gives you praise, you know? Remember that? The other angels collectively heave an unsatisfied sigh. I don't think love is ridiculous, says Azazel. I think we need and deserve to love and be loved. Samyaza's face brightens, and he says, Follow me, but leave the meat suits and don't show yourselves yet. You use this as a framing device, right? Because the framing of device is kind of episodic. Enoch appears and is going to tell us a story from the history of humanity and eternity. Then next week we have a different story. And then there's a couple of two-parters and that sort of thing in there. Did you have any thoughts about maybe you know, like an overarching long-term narrative? Yeah, we switched format about halfway. <laughs> Because uh, from part seven and onward, it's one overarching story. And I think we will keep working in that way uh, the coming seasons as well, just to keep, because uh, the, the other way of working was very unfocused, mm -hmm. uh, sort of. Uh, yeah, but it was also a, a conscious decision because we knew that we were too inexperienced to write long format. So, mm -hmm. so we planned to actually make this as an anthology that, that you should be able to, to listen to most of each episode as a standalone. But then along the way, we added this, um, this Enoch storyline that has a couple of minutes in each episode where we follow him and his, um, his, journey. To, his journey to belong in heaven. In episode six, you, you started adding new cast. And you, you said you switched format into sort of a long term kind of thing. Tell me why. Why did you make this transition? Mainly because I didn't think I have what it takes to portray that many different characters. <laughs> um, like uh, props to people who do their podcasts all on their own. But right. uh, I didn't think it sounded the way I wanted it to. Uh, Tommy yeah. doesn't agree with me. He thinks I do voices great, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, 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 and that's one reason we did it. We, we also had this uh, table read where we sent in our script and actors got to read. Uh, mm -hmm. The main feedback that we got was that it was too heavy on narration. So from that moment onwards, we, we tried to try to write more in the lines of show, don't tell. We got a lot more dialogue heavy. So that means more voices, of course. Which yeah. was, it was a lot of fun to bring in new voice actors, but it's also a whole other challenge to herd all these voice actors. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, yes, bring in all the lines and that kind of thing. How was that transition? How did that go for you? At first, we didn't really know how we were going to go about this. Like, in what order do we do it? Um, do I record first and they listen to it and act against me? Or <laughs> like, right. how are we going to do this? Uh, we were confused and a bit unsure at our first table read. Like, I remember I was super nervous uh, for our first table read. And that was just with two actors. Sure. Right. I think we both had watched a lot of behind the scenes interviews, like mm -hmm. the, with, with, with actors discussing how they like their directors. And, mm -hmm. and we had a clue on how it should be done. Now that you've done it, do you like this better than just the two of you working definitely, alone? Definitely, definitely. It's uh, less lonely and uh, it's nice to have that bit of accountability. Like there are actors waiting for you to finish producing this thing <laughs> so they can hear it. <laughs> right. I completely agree. The, the accountability is great for motivation, but I can still enjoy the heavy narration storytelling style but it's also very nice to have multiple actors to, to like um, talk to uh, about your ideas and uh, get feedback from it's a and lot then they can shorter. bring in their interpretation of what you wrote exactly. and right. it might be something yeah. you never thought of i'm curious as to how you feel about those early episodes now when you look back on them 
I feel both good and bad about it because compared to the rest of the show, uh, I feel like the pilot is like the weird kid who sits at the back of the class and eats glue. <laughs> like it's a pilot and it shows. We hadn't fleshed out the universe back then and we weren't sure exactly where we wanted to go with this. But we were still stuck in doing it according to how the original story was written, you know, the mm. first book of Enoch. But other than that, I'm still happy with the general mood of it all. Like yeah. it's a story I'd enjoy listening to myself. And yeah, and I, I think we did a pretty good job of laying that foundation for the rest of the episodes. This is a satire of the Judeo-Christian mythology. Why did you want to specifically pick this mythos to talk about? I think it's because it's very close in our culture. Like whether we like it or not, like Scandinavians like to toot our horn that we are super atheist, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still very ingrained in our culture, in uh, mm -hmm. like Western cultures overall. Sure. Even our even our common names are biblical, so I think I... it's just mm, it was close at hand. But we have also discussed to expand to other mythologies. And we have some other mythologies yeah. as well. Like uh, the angel Asha is from Zoroastrian mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we yeah. like to read texts about uh, yeah, all of the Indian religions, even the re religions that the Judaism is partly based on. That's yeah, the Mesopotamian yes. stories. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating We're because they are so old. Like yes. from an archaeological perspective, it's just so interesting. And yeah, we, we do take inspiration from mythologies all over the world. We have made an effort to find common ground between them. So, for example, the flood story that appears in many mythologies all over <laughs> the world. So, so we try to target those that have common ground. I wonder if there's something about the fact that most of the Western, I don't want to say most people, but I would say a lot of the Western culture, especially, and, and a lot of people were, if, if not brought up in the Judeo-Christian tradition, had that really woven into the fabric of their thought. When you start poking fun at, you know, specifically the God of the Bible, that's a little closer to home than, say, I don't know, Thor or Zeus. Marvel can release a movie where they poke fun at Zeus and Thor and no one bats an eye because those traditions, while they're around, no one really practices them anymore. At least for those of us who were raised in this tradition, it can be a very visceral kind yeah, of reaction. It ruffles though. a few feathers, for sure. <laughs> Enoch decides to jump right into it so that he can leave this unsettling realm as soon as possible. He is now telling God about everything he can remember, while God smiles. There is actually always a smile on his face, it just has different qualities. Anyway, as Enoch gets to the bit about what he calls lovemaking and violent offspring, the smile changes and the entire throne room shines with a furious pink light. And God, who is allegedly all-knowing, sputters a series of incoherent noises. Wait! Stop! Desist! I figured out the rest. I didn't even think they would want to defile themselves like that. And children, they shouldn't be able to. How does that even work? Who designed that? This buffoon, apparently, because I was so uncomfortable with the junk that I let it stay on the angelic meat suits because I didn't want to bother modifying it anymore. And now this mess. But somebody has to tell them that what they did was not cool. There is a beat of total silence. Enoch, I have a job for you. Do you get complaints? Do you get people who um, write angry letters? And... Not yet, but I bet we will. <laughs> <laughs> There are many shows from Hollywood, for example, that already does satire on the Judeo-Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when we watched uh, Dogma, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know when it came out, like 99 or something, but they had this big disclaimer at the beginning of the movie, like, we know this is offensive, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, okay, it. you yeah. can tell this came out in the US. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but also like Supernatural and Preacher. And, sure. And, um, and also Good Omens, which, which is a big inspiration for us. So I don't feel like we're breaking any new ground, so to speak. 
people have already done this. I did notice something popping up in your show notes. And this is, I really love this. Um, you've got an uh, adult content warning that says, please be advised that this podcast is based on biblical texts and therefore may contain adult themes not suitable for children. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, no shade whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right now here, as of this recording in the United States, we're, we're having some issues with some states passing laws, specifically trying to prevent obscenity and um, specifically usually aimed at LGBTQ plus people. These same laws that have been passed in some places have been successfully used to ban the Bible in schools because it does contain genocide and sex and all these other things. Are you are you in fact throwing a little shade on on this kind of mindset? Oh definitely. I know there are a lot of bigots who have in fact not read the Bible as close as they like to think. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very satisfying <laughs> to like <laughs> do you know that in this and this chapter you're uh, says the opposite of what you're saying. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. What do you struggle with? It's always this incessant imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same. yeah. Yeah. The voice that just uh, in your head that keeps saying, uh, what if it isn't good enough? What if it, it, what if this is shit? And what if people won't like it? And yeah. all these what ifs. Mm. How do you get past that? Uh, I try to go back to not thinking so much about pleasing other people, but going back to what made me think this was fun to do for myself, mm -hmm. especially when I get like caught up in this whole pleasing others part of it. That's when it's very comforting to have a co-creator yeah. uh, and we can just bounce ideas back and forth together and making each other laugh and go back to that part of just having fun mm. instead of just, oh, we need to produce content. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I try to remind myself uh, and Rebecca at times that, that this is a, a learning process. It's not about a single episode. It's about learning to produce an endless stream of good episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so on every episode, we, we build skills to, uh, to tell a better story next time. So essentially, it's okay that one episode is not as good as the others. That's, that's my way of getting past the imposter syndrome. You forgive uh, yourself. <laughs> yes. How do you measure success? I try not to stare blindly at the download numbers, but I do. <laughs> but uh, every time someone like sends us a comment of what specifically did they like about this episode or this and this, that means so much to me. And even more so if it comes from a fellow creator, because you know that they are looking at things from the producer perspective, like they notice little things that mm. the common listener might not. One part of su success, I would think, is <laughs> each review is a success. And every time we make someone laugh, every time we make each other laugh, that's a success. I rely a lot about how Rebecca and I feel about the episode. So I try to keep track of how many times we laugh in an episode. So yeah. if we laugh, laugh about every five minutes or so, then it's a good pacing or good amount of jokes or comedy in it. Seems like a severe but justified punishment. Good. Good. Go to them and deliver the message. Yep. Make it so. I have spoken. How do I get back again, Lord? Ah, yes. I will... What's the word? I will yeet you. What? Yeet! If you enjoy metaphysical satire, such as good omens or dogma, you'll enjoy Be Not Afraid. The struggles of Enoch are relatable, in that while we may not have to deal with incompetent angels and distracted deities, there may be days when we feel the universe is, in some way, fundamentally broken. And then it'll be good to have a laugh. You can listen to Be Not Afraid on most major podcast platforms or see our show notes for more information. The first episode of is written and produced by W. Keith Timms. All the opinions expressed in this show belong to the people who expressed them and not necessarily to anyone else. The theme song is Mockingbird by David Mumford. This show is a production of Alien Ghost Robot Creative Media. 
If you want more information, want to sign up for our newsletter, or are an audio drama creator and would like to be on the show, visit our website at thefirstepisodeof.com. We're happy to be a part of the Audio Drama Lab, a Discord-based resource for audio drama development and networking. Check it out at audiodramalab.com. Keep telling stories. It's the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Until next time. I know you got questions about him. Where did he come from? How did he do all those things they say he did? Was he a terrorist? Was he crazy? Was his skin really blue? Well, I'll tell you what I know. I was there with him, driving through the back roads under the stars. I was witness to wonders and miracles and to the darkness that's coursing through the veins of our country. He came to fight it in his own strange way, but no one leaves that fight unchanged. Not even Rael. People ought to know the truth. And I was there. The Book of Constellations is a down-to-earth sci-fi road trip. It's audio fiction, and you can find episodes at bookofconstellations.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's Keith. Have you ever thought about creating your own audio drama? Ever wanted to make your first episode of something? Then you should know about the Audio Drama Lab. It's a Discord-based resource for audio drama development and networking. You can connect with other creators, find actors and musicians, and even incubate your idea with step-by-step advice, accountability, and encouragement. Check it out at audiodramalab.com and start telling your story.